When you look at an M1 Abrams tank, you'll often spot these two squares on the turret cheeks. Easy to miss, these panels are quite important, but not a lot of people actually know what they're for. You might hear that they are to do with squadron or company markings, that they signify the use of depleted uranium armor, or even that they are something to do with an active protection system. The answer, however, is entirely different. Welcome everybody to the Armorcast channel. My name is Joshua, also known as Koala, and today, we're going to talk about what the hell these things are. This video is brought to you by supporters like you. Thanks for helping me keep the lights on. The M1 Abrams is undoubtedly one of the most recognisable and feared tanks in the world. It pretty much set the standard for main battle tanks back in the 80s and has had a very well respected pedigree ever since. One thing it proved vulnerable to when it fought in Iraq in the Gulf War, however, was a bit of the old friendly fire. That fun little team deathmatch against the Iraqi T-72 has turned into more of a free-for-all for a couple of operations there. The thing you have to understand is that the way you see these vehicles in movies and especially video games is usually pretty far from how they're really used, with tight formations, headlong charges through hostile fire, and of course you're really only there for one element of the battlefield. In reality, battle areas can be hugely spread out and involve many different assets all moving and coordinating independently, or at least indirectly with each other. You've got multiple platoons of four tanks, which is the smallest tank unit on the battlefield, belonging to different companies, that's 14 tanks, or three platoons plus two command vehicles, and you've then got another two levels above that, with sometimes well over a hundred tanks present, covering an area which could be 10 miles wide and span multiple different types of terrain. Now the crews of these vehicles obviously can all coordinate with each other directly. Instead, they have a chain of command they relay information through, and they don't all know where each other is all the time. In standard doctrine, if a platoon or company of tanks is moving through a hostile location, they'll have what's called overwatch from friendly forces with some distance or elevation to keep watch as you move through potentially vulnerable areas and provide cover fire if necessary. These tanks though aren't always in direct contact with the guys they're covering like troops on the ground can be, there might be other friendly platoons manoeuvring around them, and then you've got air support that may be in the area as well. And they're all doing their best to spot targets and provide immediate fire support if needed. As such, they need a quick and simple way of detecting friendlies from enemies so that they don't have to wait for the chain of command to get back to them with who exactly they're looking at. That's precious time, every second counts. If you can engage immediately, knowing 100% that those tanks in front of you are hostile, not friendly, that's a huge win. That's where the turret panels come in. Lads, what these are are combat identification panels, or CIPs, a type of friend or foe identifier that shows up clearly on the thermal imaging systems used by modern tanks and aircraft, and allow them to pick out what's a friendly and what isn't very easily. Friendly fire, while not exactly common, has proven a large problem, especially as battlefields increase in size. If you do a quick Google search, you'll find dozens of incidents where tanks and jets have mistakenly fired at other friendly tanks, infantry vehicles and personnel carriers, particularly during night operations or when recon and communication is limited, and there have unfortunately been many fatalities from these types of incidents. This problem was so significant during Operation Desert Storm that in 1992, a proposal was submitted for a type of standardized adhesive panel that could be applied to tanks and other vehicles and would distinguish them as friendly forces. These panels work by emitting a very low thermal signature, making them easily visible against the much hotter backing of the vehicle under a thermal camera. They basically show up black against the bright background of a vehicle. Prior to this, thermal tape was put on tanks for a similar purpose, but the large standardized panels changed the game, especially for air support. These panels also aren't the only type of thermal combat ID panel. In fact, if you notice these racks here that look like Venetian blinds, they too are low thermal emissive pieces that show up black under a thermal imager and are put onto the sides and rear of Abrams turrets, as well as vehicles like Bradleys, Strikers and MRAPs that don't have a big flat surface like an Abrams turret cheek to stick a flat panel onto. They are very quick and easy to apply, cheap to produce and as such tens of thousands of these panels have been made over the past couple of decades, and they've also seen use on, for example, the Challenger 2 and the Warrior. So the most common questions I've gotten when talking about CIPs in the past are A, why don't the enemy forces just put them on their own tanks to appear as friendlies and discourage our boys from shooting at them? And B, why not just cover the tanks in them completely to make them invisible to thermal cameras? And I don't want to make anyone feel dumb for asking, but neither of those two things 
really make any sense. One thing to remember is that most of the tanks the Abrams and Challenger have been fighting in the past weren't even equipped with thermal imaging systems in the first place, they are Soviet era vehicles. But even in more recent years where exported tanks across the Middle East say are fitted with thermal sights, CIPs aren't invisible to them, in fact their whole point is to be clearly visible, to stand out and identify the vehicle. Plus it just wouldn't be feasible to cover the entire tank in this type of material to disguise it. Challenger 2s have used coatings of it to minimise their thermal signature, but when the gun is fired or if you're able to see the hot engine compartment, yeah, nothing is hiding that level of heat. Even tracks show up pretty clearly. As for opposing forces using them too, that may grant them a couple seconds where NATO tanks mistakenly identify them as friendly, but their own forces are going to be all the more encouraged to fire on them, believing them to belong to the other side. Meanwhile, the West would just develop and field a new identifier or what's happening currently is that battlefield awareness and data link software will take over the need for them entirely, so it wouldn't really work. Well lads, that is it for this episode of Koala Explains. I hope you have enjoyed and that if you did, you leave a like and make sure to subscribe for new military content every single week. If you want to support this channel, then please check us out on Patreon. Right now, this channel is brand new and therefore unmonetized, so Patreon support is our only form of income for these videos. If just a few of you watching this video subscribed for $1 a month, this channel could be self-sufficient, which means more and better content for you. That's why all our backers gain access to the exclusive ArmorCast Discord server, where we can talk about tanks, guns, and memes. We're always up for some memes. Check out the rest of the unique tiers and rewards on our Patreon page at the link below. Thanks for watching, stay safe, and I'll catch you lads on the battlefield. The season pass will go on for multiple months, and then most likely we'll rotate in new exclusive rewards and continue on next season. If those tasks that promote poor gameplay are incorporated into the season pass, this game could be in real trouble.